Welcome to our interview with Lara Assi and today we're going to be exploring the different skills that you need in a tech-centric workplace. So what skills, behaviours and knowledge you need and Lara will dive into how we can use AI in the workplace and other emerging technologies. So welcome Lara, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you Nadia, thank you for this opportunity. Always good to be back with Hundo. I drop everything while, you know, if anyone calls me from Hundo, I'm like, I'm in, whatever. <laughs> I just uh, really like what you guys do, big on the on your ethos. Um, my name is Lara, Lara Asi, and I am a Lebanese uh, based in London, Lebanese. I'm a Web3 educator uh, and mentor, and I'm an also an AI consultant. And I'm very big on um, passing the knowledge and, you know, dissembling all of the tech jargon that goes on in this space and making it, you know, more user friendly to enthusiasts and people who want to know more. Cool. Well, it's lovely having you here again because you were in our career con last year. So I'm happy to have you here. Um, so we'll dive into the questions. So how does technology such as AI and other emerging technologies affect the skills we require for the future of work? And how can we prepare and navigate a tech centric workplace? Um, so basically, I think first and foremost, we should not underestimate how these disruptive technologies are fundamentally changing the way we work, live and interact with one another. So this fourth industrial revolution that we are in, it's driven by transfer transformative technologies and it's reinventing business models to, to say the least. Now, I don't want to be a drama queen, but, you know, a lot of blue color and white color jobs are going to be at risk in the next 10 years so <coughs> excuse me so i think that we need to deal with this in a proactive way and when i say proactive way two things come to my mind which is digital literacy and adaptability now we hear you know digital literacy um, everyone's talking about this but what does it mean it's really just the ability to use and understand and navigate digital tools now, how can we do this? We can do this through hands-on experience, meaning use these tools. Like, don't be afraid of just trying things because familiar familiarity often comes through, you know, experience and practice. So this mm -hmm. is the number yeah. one in digital lit literacy. And then take these online courses. It's a very open source vibe. Uh, you know, this whole technological revolution. So you find a lot of online mm -hmm. courses and content and material to to dabble into and then absolutely stay informed because uh, this is an ongoing process. If you don't catch up, you're going to miss that, uh, yeah. you know, E-train. <laughs> and that's like digital literacy and adaptability. Why do I say adaptability? Because I feel that we are in an era of uh, continuous learning. Uh, we have yeah. to stay up to date we have to be informed we have to have this growth mindset in order to keep up and always think how can i solve this problem how can i have more mm -hmm. friends or people in this space that ex can explain to me this or that so yeah mm -hmm. i think digital literacy adaptability they work well together and a important point that you may obviously keeping up to date, especially with the tech environment, it's always changing, there's new technology. How do you keep up with everything? And what advice can you give young people and people watching this on how they can stay updated? Absolutely. So I'm going to tell you about my small experience with AI. So I've been working with AI, like not up close and personal, but I had because I work in emerging tech and, you know, the AI boom happened last year. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. so I understand the fundamentals, but how much should I understand to be able to, you know, work or consult uh, companies on whether yeah. they should integrate AI to their business models or not? So I immediately mm -hmm. just started taking courses. Uh, you have a lot of courses on, you know, Coursera and the likes of Coursera, these free, free uh, platforms. You have a lot mm -hmm. of AI experts on different social media platforms, whether it's LinkedIn or uh, Twitter. So sign up to these newsletters that you hate signing up for. Sign up to a weekly yeah. <laughs> newsletter that can sum up what's happening in the world. And then if you want to dive yeah. in, just get certified. So get certified, take these courses. Um, I know that, for example, Stanford and Oxford are doing excellent uh, 
courses mm -hmm. if if you're able to to uh, pay for that. But if not, there's a lot of open source, um, a lot of information on the internet. So use the internet to get informed. This is what I always say. Yeah, no, definitely. That's why we wanted to launch Career Com Monthly and dive into different topics because there's so much happening and we feel like this is a way and it's free resources. Obviously, you can come on 100 XYZ or our platform or YouTube to help people learn and stuff. And it's important, like ha keeping up to date and learning this information and then just using it for your to help you with your personal growth and even the workplace and finding people networking, like you said, finding your community. So what are the key skills and knowledge, both technical and non-technical, that you believe young people should focus on to succeed in a tech-driven workplace? Okay, so I'm I'm just going to address an elephant in the room, as they say, which is our outdated global educational system. I mean, we can't just lay this on you know young people. I mean, young people do not have the capabilities to have you know or adopt these technical uh, or non-technical skills and knowledge. So we don't see any mm -hmm. flexibility in our educational system, the institutions, the pathways that allow students to effectively explore multiple tech disciplines. So this is something that I hope uh, is going to be addressed very soon because the tech is not waiting for anyone. It's just moving forward. Yeah. And yeah, so integrating this, this digital literacy in, in our educational systems is, is pivotal mm -hmm. to the next, you know, 10 know. years of, of the lives of these young people. And also just have some collaborations between educational institutions and tech companies, you know, having these mm -hmm. tech experts come to classes and do the talks and say that this is mm -hmm. where you need to be focusing on. Uh, if you're thinking about this career, think of how to, you know, have digital literacy in parallel because this is where the digi yeah. this is where we're going, digitization. So, yeah, there's a new language in town, uh, educational systems, educational <laughs> institutions, and that's coding. Uh, so I think that teaching yeah. coding first and foremost, coding and the un basic fundamentals of AI and machine learning in schools, this should have started yesterday. And just as mm -hmm. we were taught, you know, the English language or any language actually to be able to converse and understand and communicate with other people yeah. and communicate with people at work we need to understand mm -hmm. code to understand computers so i think that the yeah. first and foremost is you know these these educational institutions to push harder i know that there are a lot of things going on in the world a lot of um educational systems thinking of you know effective ways to onboard uh ai literacy or digital literacy into the system yeah. But now for, for the non-technical skills, we, we said what, you know, governments and education should do for the non-technical <laughs> skills. What young people can do is two things for me, like first and foremost, problem solving and communication skills. Why? Problem solving because the tech that's coming or the dawn of, of these disruptive technologies, all of the jobs, especially tech driven jobs, will have a good deal of addressing complex issues. Every day you're going to okay. have this new AI model, like new whatever in tech. And you need to understand it. You need to see if this is going to pose a problem if you don't adopt it now or not. And if I adopt this technology, how will I use it? How will my, how yeah. will this fit in the framework? So problem solving, creativity as well in the back of our mind, because I don't think that technology will take over or AI will take over. I think it's going to unlock mm -hmm. A lot of, you know, these parts in our brains that we haven't had the chance to explore, yeah. which is creativity. I mean, these autonomous, you know, or automating uh, repetitive tasks is going to take a lot uh, off our shoulders. So we're going to be left yeah. with this critical thinking, problem solving and communication skills. Absolutely. Because if you're working in a tech environment, uh, you're talking the tech language or you have this tech jargon around you. So. In order for you to be communicating with other people, especially like different stakeholders in organizations, you need to be able to translate to talk the, this tech jargon to non-technical people. Yeah. And communication is, is key, you know, with technology or without technology. It's a skill that I think must people, you know, young people must have. They must have. Yeah. 
No, I definitely agree. Communication is very important across everything. Problem solving and that adaptability is another one. Like when I started working with Hondo, this is my first tech um, working in a tech company, and we work so fast. And it's like being able to adapt to that and working fast paced. And not everyone can adapt to that, which is absolutely fine. But when you do come to work in these like tech environments, you realize how fast things move, and you just have to get on with it. There's something that you definitely need to learn and have in the back of your mind that it's like keeping up to date with everything, make sure you know what you're doing, communicating with the team, make sure everyone's on the same page. Like one day you come in, it's one thing, the next day it changes and the project changes. There's, yeah, having that problem solving and everything and finding solutions for different things. So yeah, I agree, those skills are very, very important. And from um, the how does work tip- aspect, sorry. <laughs> I, just okay. wanted, I just wanted to say like from a communications aspect as well, just don't be afraid to ask a stupid question because yeah. there's no such thing as a stupid question. And I know that it's a cliche, but I like a lot of my friends who wanted to work in, in tech, but they don't come from a technical background. They really gave up on opportunities because they didn't ask that question. Mm-hmm. You know, just ask the yeah. question, say that I don't understand that. Can you please explain to me what does this technology do or how can I utilize it or how can I interact with this software or ask these questions and seek help mm. because it's it's not really wrong and no one knows all the answers and we learn something every day and in order for you to advance you need to learn you need to ask yeah definitely even like with the ai tools that we use like chat gpt and the donte ai there's a few that we start to integrate in our work to help us be more productive and help and at first a lot of us were like we're not used to this it's very new but then when you start using it understanding it understand how how to use it what to use it for then you realize oh it's just like using a google doc or another like slack or something it's the same thing and it's like it's really important to learn communicate and like learn these things so yeah it's really important so how does work tech contribute to making sure that emerging technologies are used for positive transitions rather than displacing workers uh okay that's uh uh, well the drama queen is gonna come out because (laughs) ai will. i want the drama queen to come out (laughs) i'm not gonna say that ai will not displace workers ai will displace workers and it's not because this technology is bad per se but i mean ai is at the core of core of this you know fourth industrial revolution so just like previous industrial revolution, some job became obsolete while new jobs emerged. So and mm-hmm. there's this th- saying that I like and I feel it's very relevant both for me like in, in a, on a personal level and on a career level is that the only constant thing is change. The only constant thing in our life is change. And we need to keep up because life will not stop for anyone. So mm-hmm. now that AI is here, what shall that you know, work tech do? Embrace it embrace it and empower by shifting the focus of the employees to the strategic aspect of their work rather than the time consuming Mm -hmm. and repetitive work and that's something that work tech you know scene or community should be proactively doing and how would they do it Mm -hmm. trainings skill development you know this 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 empowerment should come from within these organizations that are looking to adopt immersive um, um, disruptive technologies such as ai um and that's how they will you know allow their employees or give them this space where they can upskill and reskill in response to these you know changing Mm -hmm. job requirements or changing you know settings and also just promote this positive transfer transformation Mm -hmm. you know because everyone's scared everyone's thinking will i lose my job is this the end of an era Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they really need to promote it like foster collaboration uh you know, talk about automation, let people understand what is data driven decision making, for example, and, you know, work on their skills, develop their skills. So I think this just embracing this and leveraging emerging technologies to their advantage while minimizing the risk of, you know, work displacement is is the way forward Mm -hmm. for the work tech community. Automation is a key component of emerging technologies. What are the pen- potential benefits and challenges of increased automation in the workplace? For individuals to be able to work alongside these AI systems, like what skills do you think are important to develop? Well, automation, fascinating, right? 
I just like I'm, yeah. I'm in awe about like of how automation where is gonna make our lives easier and people are just so afraid mm-hmm. of it but I mean increased automation improves efficiency that's it I, and this is you know this is the equation for me because humans make errors and automation hopefully uh, don't like the error you know the margin of that error is greatly mm-hmm. minimized so when automation can perform these repetitive and time consuming tasks and why not and it really would significantly significantly reduce costs for organizations of course so and it's also good in you know dangerous tasks because why why would we want to lose you know an arm or a leg in, in certain tasks mm-hmm. or jobs so automation really does serve us uh, as humans uh, yeah. for the challenges I mean again work displacement just because a lot of these jobs out there revolve around repetitive tasks like even if we can solve these yeah. issues of you know just making things faster what will happen to to these people who actually do these repetitive yeah. tasks so uh, if they were not displaced they will really fa- face the skills mismatch because you know as automation is yeah. becoming more prevalent, there is a growing gap between the work processes or the workers' process and the skills required yeah. in these automated industries. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and another thing that I always think of is privacy and security concerns, and a lot of people don't talk about this. I mean, how is automation related to that? But automation does handle sensitive data, and there is still mm-hmm. concerns about data privacy, security breaches. Imagine someone just hacking this big automa- automation, yeah. whatever, and just destroying everything. So yeah. we still have these risks. We still have privacy issues. We still have regulations. Mm-hmm. They're still not put in place. I mean, the EU is moving fast. The UK is doing things about yes. it. But we still don't have regulations on hand to be able to navigate the, the, the system, you know, and also the cost is really high. People talk about automation as if yeah. you know, they can just pick it up uh, tomorrow, which is not true. I mean, yeah. it's, the costs are high. Uh, a lot of resistance going to be in the workplace. So, yeah, good things and, and bad things about automation at the moment. But I yeah. think if, if we just go back to the to the skills, I would always say literacy, literacy. I mean, in terms of automation this is mainly to the to the organization because even if you upskill yourself and you work on yourself mm-hmm. if if the organization does yeah. not want to keep you know a thousand employees they're just going to let them go so uh for me it's it's about just being proactive to what's happening if you're someone who works uh in the tech industry, but st- but your tasks are really limited to repetitive work. Look on how you can advance yourself. Look on yes. into these again these learning, um, I say aids, learning aids that are there. Mm. Try yeah. to, I I'd say like to, try to have that digital weapon on your side. You know, you need to have weapons. To, to live and now yeah. we're not in an era of where people fight each other physically but but we you need to fight for for having this good job and a good and like career advancements and all of that mm-hmm. so have that digital weapon next to you beside you so it can just you know get your chances get you better chances yeah. in landing that job yeah I don't know if I'm, I I, I remember <laughs> I remember in the interview you did for us for Crickon last year, I remember you said like coding is like a digital weapon. It is. And I always remember that. And I feel like I do want to do coding because it's on my list. (laughs) So one day, hopefully this year or next year, I'll do that. But like what sort of, um, so when you talk about digital weapons. Because you were were tapping on this. So there's this um, code for girls so this is an yes. organization do you know them i love them because yeah i see them on instagram amazing i'm not like a shout out to them just because i i wanted to learn python and i was like i at, at that mm-hmm. time i i couldn't just you know enroll and pay for that i had a lot on my plate and i was like you know what i'm gonna yeah. reach out and ask if they would offer me a seat and they did and i learned python <gasps> and it was amazing 
well, because I know that I'm not gonna be coding today, but I need to understand code to understand yeah. the infrastructure yeah. of these models that are being built, especially that Python is one of the languages used for AI and yeah. like AI models and yeah, neural yeah. networks and whatnot. So, yeah. Yeah, I'll definitely contact them because yeah, I do follow them. Um, and like you said, I need to talk to them. But if they reach, if you reach out to them, they were responsive. Then yeah, I need to definitely Very. contact them and see. Because definitely something. Because I see like all the posts that they do and how many women they've helped and young girls, and it just looks really cool. So yeah, um, what kind of work ethic and attitude do you believe is critical for success in the future of work? Uh okay. So I'm gonna talk about ethics and then ethics in AI if you're working in AI because you have yeah. these pitfalls and we don't want to you know mm. go down that uh, route so ethics basically as you were saying just be proactive you have to have that you know attitude yeah. first and foremost mm. and and as we said that you need to take these initiatives to learn and adapt so be really open-minded be uh, willing to uh, do that mistake and ask that question and take your time because this is really yeah. time consuming what's what's happening in this yeah. world you you know we we sleep we wake up and there's like chat gpt remember when chat gpt was yeah. out? we just that people were not prepared they were not prepared yeah, to, to this shift you know to this it's it's a paradigm mm -hmm. shift natural language processing yeah. i mean that's crazy <laughs> so yeah. I think it's just being proactive and knowing that things are going to change very fast and just to have mm -hmm. that proactive uh, attitude and don't re resist res don't resist change or just turn a blind eye on the advancements that will soon materialize to be job requirements so just yeah. you know start adopting this pro proactive attitude embrace these technologies have a growth mindset be resilient it's okay not to know things. Yeah. It's okay to feel overwhelmed, but it's not okay just to sit there and, and, and do nothing. So, and a very interesting number. I was like doing, mm -hmm. uh, I was reading an article last uh, week and you have around 4,000, uh, 4,000, 432,000 businesses in the UK who have already adopted AI solutions or AI te technologies. Oh, wow. That's like, that's like one in six businesses in the UK. Yeah. So it's it's really moving fast. So proactivity yeah. is is the key to you know keep up with this. Yeah, I mean I feel like people that aren't using AI systems are behind, and they're they're stopping themselves from growing and achieving more. So I feel like since using AI um, at Hondo and for my work and stuff, I feel like I'm so much more productive. I can get so much more done in less time and it's just like and it helps me grow and think of ideas and stuff like that like especially marketing you always constantly think of ideas where absolutely I chat gbt something it just helps enhance your it, brain it and unlocks, everything it's just like it unlocks your mind yeah yeah it and does the thing is that a lot of people you know creative people know mm -hmm. how to utilize ai tools because like yes. for me i come from like I have a lot of creativity, but sometimes I'm stuck somewhere. You know, sometimes I'm just yeah. overwhelmed and like, you know, this yeah, cold start problem. Like, how do I articulate this? Or how do I start thinking about that or whatever? So mm -hmm. when I resort to chat GPT, GPT, I'm not like a copy paste person. Never. Don't do that mm -hmm. with AI. It's just no. read what read the output. Uh, be sure yeah. to know how to prompt the AI model that you're using. Just don't tell him what is this or what is that no you need to have a very coherent prompt that the ai yeah. would respond to and would give you an optimized output so that's yeah. something as well learn how to prompt guys prompting ai is key to getting the best out of the ai model that you're using um yeah, yeah so i use chat gpt and it's a tool it enhances everything so why not use it yeah. i've been yeah absolutely yeah, and I agree with you. It helps enhance and it helps you grow, personal growth as well. And it's like, like you said, like sometimes marketing, I'm like, I'm stuck on a post or I'm stuck on like, what to do next? And it's like giving them a prompt and just having ideas and just think, oh, 
that's actually a good idea let me try use that and like enhance it and think of something better and it's just using those tools but it's like using like I explain it to my friends and I tell them that the tools I use and that I'm like oh you should use this for your work and stuff and then then they use it and like oh my god like this is so cool I have like my company don't use this or why haven't I used this before and it is very cool having them and like you said it helps you and it makes you it makes your brain see things differently and helps you grow so yeah it's really cool so now talking about ethical considerations obviously is an important topic when it comes to ai um so what ethical challenges do you see happening in the workplace as ai systems become more common and what steps can organizations and even educators address so basically with with ai there are a lot of pitfalls that um people Mm -hmm. are still they don't understand the implications of, of these pitfalls. So, and it's all it all has to do with with ethics. First of all, algorithmic bias. So let's talk about bias, and let's talk about the the theory of garbage in, garbage out. So the basis of all things AI is data. What you feed the AI, it's gonna process, it's gonna do its thing in the black in the in its black box, and it's gonna give you an output. Now, throughout you know humanity and the history of us on this earth, we have a lot of bias, and this bias is translated yeah. into our digitization. Like everything that you see online, and every single piece of data can have bias uh, embedded mm-hmm. into it because it's a human who who actually initiated or created yeah. this data. So the thing is that when you want to have or you want to adopt an AI model, you have to make sure that the data that you're giving is not biased as all, at all, because AI is not biased, but you can, if you train it on biased data, it's gonna give you a biased output. So it's yeah, very important, true. guys. Garbage in, garbage out. This is what uh, our professor in, in Oxford told us when I was taking an AI program. And it really <laughs> stuck to me because it's it's all about yeah. data. So. Algorithmic bias, not only algorithmic bias and because AI bleeds into everything. So let's talk about, for example, using an AI model or an AI application for recruiting. The whole recruitment process and, you know, the CVs out there and the amount of jobs that are taken by men as opposed to women is is Mm. is there. So when when you give when you feed Mm. all this data to the AI, it's going to give you male um, candidates for certain jobs for example and this a lot of you know recruitment um ai uh, you know ai driven recruitment softwares have faced this and they had to back propagate and go like bad ai no this is this is not what you should be saying so it's Mm -hmm. always having you know experts around Mm -hmm. engineers who can back propagate and who can refine and fine-tune the data that's been you know fed to this ai model it's it's really crucial to you know that's to be ethical and to be fair you know and to actually hire the right person and not hire someone who has been given this uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, he nominated just because uh he was he he, he um again uh, and not uh, and not hire someone who has been uh, a good candidate yeah. because of the ai algorithm and not because of the yeah. competency actually so that's one it i can yeah. so AI, ai ethics it's because ai is bleeding to every industry so we have a lot of you know ethical considerations to to take mm-hmm. into consideration uh, regulations, once the regulations are in, we are not going to have a lot of issues because that's going to um, force a lot of organizations into abiding by these um, set of rules or yeah. the framework that has been put. So I know that the EU has been working really, really hard on uh, achieving you know, this framework or having a trustworthy AI framework. And they talked about they had mm-hmm. a lot of requirements. Some of them were um, yeah. like the societal and environmental well-being. This is one very big ethical consideration. Transparency, yeah. because you're just 
mm-hmm. accumulating this data you're using this data yeah. and so what yeah. about transparency what about privacy what about human agency what about you know mm-hmm. safety technical robustness accountability who's to blame when something goes wrong is it the ai is it the human behind the ai is it the engineer so a lot of these um ethical considerations are still being debated on a daily basis to see how how yeah we can shape a good framework for organizations to be using and for employees as well because even if you're yeah. using ai in an organization you really need to understand that okay yeah. so this i should not be doing or this is like privacy it's a privacy breach i need to like go back to someone and ask about this or that so again be mindful be proactive yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. understand that sometimes ai cannot give you an explanation of its decision mm-hmm. and that's when you dive, yeah. dive into deep learning and neural networks a neural network and the layers in the neural network is a black box no one understand what's happening inside it until now you cannot understand <laughs> how the algorithm or the weights ha- of of these nodes have been uh divided yeah. or you know allocated to get this output so if you cannot explain the output of this ai how can you adopt it how can you adopt this output how can you say this is what i'm going with or this prediction yeah if you don't understand what's what happened in the back end so a lot of ethical considerations to to ponder and think about for both organizations and people who are you know ai enthusiasts who want to dabble into the space and you know have a ai related job somehow somehow yeah no, it's really interesting hearing the points that you said because like we did our ai um crickon event in june and it's like i asked everyone a similar question is the ethics and everyone gave their different opinions so it's nice hearing different stuff and there's things that you mentioned that people haven't mentioned before which you need to think about like put the data you input to the AI telling the prompts all of that is even like considering because like you can't like you said the recruit example just having males come through for tech roles and then having to train it and be like no that's not what we want we want to go back and then redo it and it's like and then it, it makes people understand that it, even though it's an AI system we still have control as humans to like tell it what to do and how to prompt it. And I think that's the important thing because a lot of people think just because it's tech, tech's taking over, tech's like taking control, but really we still have the human element of putting our input and telling it what to do and what we want specifically. So still having that control. And even and I feel if like it's that's important. Data, absolutely, because if you have some AI models that pull data out of anywhere. So if you mm. look at LinkedIn, for example, and you see the tech jobs, uh, that are posted on LinkedIn. And if the AI can figure out how many men are applying versus how many women, it's it's yeah. really sad because, you know, sometimes just men apply if they feel that they are a 40% fit, you know, mm. of this. But us women, we would think that I have to have that 90% fit because if I don't know how yeah, to do this, true. I'm not going to apply. So... Well, that's yeah. well. That's how we say see it. The AI doesn't see it. The algorithms is saying that oh look, we have this ratio of male to woman, um, yeah. men to women. You know, applying for these jobs is it because that's men true. are better? They don't care about the XXXY chromosome AI. It's just algorithms. Yeah. So it's up for us to yeah. fine tune this data and just feed AI. Uh, or just you know train it on equality and diversity we can do that <laughs> yeah yeah definitely and it's important like you said is whatever we give the AI application that's what they're going to feed from so it's our responsibility to make sure that the information it has is reflecting what we want so yeah and it's very important so looking into like parents and educators what can parents and ed- educators do to help their children and students develop digital skills that we need for this future work that we're entering? Well, um, we've already talked about, you know, our educational system being a bit mm-hmm. outdated, actually very outdated. <laughs> it's the drama of yeah. Koenig. <laughs> and, but I mean, if, if I want to start first with the educators themselves, let's talk about the teachers. You cannot prepare the students yeah. 
for what's coming if the teachers are not knowledgeable about the subject mm-hmm. matter. So you have two things. It's either you're going to send this teacher away and say, oh, well, you can't, you know, teach this. So you're, you're, you're obsolete now. Or you can empower them. And yeah. this is where the change mm-hmm. needs to start. This is the, you know, the, the proactive approach that governments and educational institutions yeah. should be approaching this. Empower the, the teacher. So I think around four years ago, the UK government announced um, an ed tech strategy. Great. Amazing. So yeah. there was like a 10 million pound. It, 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 it is a 10 million pound uh, backed strategy. It, it's it's you know the the money is going to support innovation raise the bar in schools colleges and universities in england but teachers and lecturers uh, and educational experts need to unite with innovative businesses and this is what i always say i mean great the government is doing something but if if teachers can do a proactive step in uniting with these innovative businesses and harnessing the power of technology Mm -hmm. to tackle these challenges that's that's how we can ensure that those working in education are equipped with the necessary skills and tools to meet this. So a teacher, just as the student, needs to be proactive about it, needs to uh, resort to open source information rather than just wait for the system to change or you know for the institution to say, yeah. hey, we need to like jump on this. And uh, because mm-hmm. I see, I mean... I've always been fascinated by teachers. A lot of my teachers have imprinted on me with a little, you know, like a, a phrase here or a phrase there or the way they approach uh, teaching and whatnot. And I think they are yeah. fascinating human beings because we mm-hmm. all are, you know, we owe our lives and careers to these people who helped us succeed and yeah. learn. So when we think about this technological change, especially with disruptive technologies, they're just not equipped for this. So I need to, we need mm-hmm. to give them a lot, a lot of empowerment and space for them to grow and understand how they should tackle yeah. this. So, and yeah, the, the 10 million, it's, it's not enough, but it's, it was a start. And as we were saying, yeah. educators, please update your own digital skills and knowledge just to be able to mm-hmm. effectively teach uh, these emerging technologies, yeah. attend workshops and conferences, online courses tailored to teachers uh, from tech-related industries. Um, ask these professionals, these tech professionals, to come to speak to your students about career opportunities, real-world application of, of technologies. And, you yeah. know, for parents, provide that access to technology. I mean, I am a parent myself. Mm. I'm, a, I'm a mom to a three-year-old, and I'm just in this constant dilemma of, giving her that iPad or not giving her that iPad. But then I was like, no, yeah. I'm going to give her that iPad and I'm going to have these amazing tools on it, uh, mm-hmm. games, educational games, and just for her to be one with technology because the generation that's yeah. coming, it's one with technology. It's, it's, there's this yes. fusion that's going to happen and people can't still see it. And as much as, I, as we find it bizarre, I mean, I'm I'm older than you, Nadia. I am. I I witnessed pre-internet. I was alive during the yeah. pre-internet era, and then when the internet went to you know modems and everything, and where you used to dial, and it was so weird for for us to adapt to this to to this new technology. Yeah. While you have um, kids born into this technology now, maybe born through this. Yeah. Technology. yeah. Uh, it's just yeah. it's, it's it's fascinating. So I think that as parents, first of all, we need to accept that this is the new reality, and we need to acknowledge yes. that this is the the new reality. Now, <coughs> sorry. Yes, we need to monitor the screen time, the screen time, but we need to provide educational, you know, tools for them, and just foster a loving level of learning and this curiosity about technology. And then just teach them digital literacy. I mean, a lot of my friends are enrolling their eight-year-olds, like six to eight-year-olds in coding um, courses. Mm-hmm. They're like so fun and, you know, wicked, and they're just learning how to code at eight. And, you know, we have that capacity as humans, and children have yeah. that capacity. And sadly, our educational systems limit it, 
in some places while technology doesn't mm -hmm. so you know be one with technology and encourage your your children to jump on these courses and enroll them in these courses so yeah 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 i definitely agree i remember one of my colleagues last year was telling me that he sends his kids to a coding school and it's called coding ninja and from i think the age of like three maybe four upwards they go after school and they learn coding and they make it really cool and they make all these cool coding stuff and then they make they use lego and all these cool things and i was like wow like when i was younger i'm 25 now when i was younger we didn't have any of that and obviously similar to what it is now girls were really focused on like art english and boys were like math science and all of that and i feel like now that we're starting to see people now pushing and making sure that it's equality between both girls and boys in schools as well which is really cool and like you said teachers to help them grow they need to have the space and resources to help them to learn about these emerging technologies it's so like how honda is doing virtual work experiences and part of that we go into schools and we talk to the teachers and the teachers have no idea about these ai systems and then we have to then train them and then they're like, oh my God, why haven't we been using this? Like we could have been planning our lessons with this and doing this Absolutely. and this. And it's like, and it's like, it's just crazy how they don't use it. So I'm hoping, yeah, hopefully, I'm mm. um, fingers and crossed in like a few years time. Like, that... Absolutely, it's gonna change. Nadia, it's gonna change. It has to change. Yeah. So, but the only thing that I would say, and just because of that I feel as a mother, I've, I've touched upon this, mm -hmm. is the balance between real life and digital life. Yeah. Because as, mm -hmm. as children, we used to just stay outside. We had like yeah. nothing. We had no iPads. We had no, yeah. like, we were not in touch with, with technology. The, the only thing we had is yeah. like cartoons on, on, on the TV and that was very much mm -hmm. limited. So I think just finding that balance between you know, giving them this exposure to technology because technology is going to be, or digital literacy is going to be the way forward in their lives. But as, as much as that's important, it's equally important to stay in touch with, with nature and just to play outside yes. and to have friends and to, yeah, and just develop, develop these social skills as well and not just be in that yes. room and, you know, it's really good to foster the, you know, foster education, innovation and, and, and whatnot, but it's equally important to find that balance. So it's a yeah. hard job for parents. We can never get it uh, right all the time, but, you know, we try. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, like you said, balance is very important. And like you said, yes, having screen time, but giving them the tools, like having certain apps where they can learn and engage. Whereas just like going on YouTube and just watching stuff that isn't relevant. So it's, yeah, it's about screen time, but having a dedicated screen time, which will help them. And then also having time with nature and doing things. Because like, like you said, one of the things that I've learned when we're talking to our young people is that they don't have those social skills because they're so they like they're very scared to like, even like when we have video calls with them, they have their cameras off, they don't want to talk. And like those skills is really important in the workplace. And like talking, communicating, like me and you having conversation, some young people find it really hard and have social anxiety. And it's like having that balance and making sure that you can do both because you need those skills and they're important. So yeah, there's a lot. But yeah, balance is really important and having these skills and just keeping up to date with everything. So I could talk to you all day, but we need I to mean, wrap up oh, now. Yeah, 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 I know. Um, so obviously, like we said, everything we spoke about, the future of work is changing, the work environment is changing constantly and a much faster pace now with the technology we have. What are a few skills that you think will be most in demand in the next three to five years? Well, absolutely, hands down, AI and machine learning expertise. Absolutely, because AI yeah. is going to bleed into every industry and this already has begun. I'm like, I just told you, like 432,000 uh, yeah. businesses in the UK have already uh, start dabbling and i mean look at the wonders that ai is doing in healthcare supply chain cybersecurity, mm. finance sustainability y you name it and they are already in in demand the the, the market is worth yeah. more than 16.9 billion pounds in the uk it's expected to grow to like a staggering 803 billion that's in 2035 20, mm. so it's it's happening and yeah 
the beauty of AI, it's it's the open sourceness of it. So you can ha- find a hell out of information like everywhere you go about AI, AI applications, how to prompt an AI, how to use this AI model. So I always say that get in- just get involved and don't miss that AI train, guys. That's an important. Did you hear that, guys? You can hear it from here. Do not miss the AI train. Hop on with us and join us. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, it's been lovely speaking to you, Lara. Um, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day. Where would you like people to connect with you? Is it LinkedIn? Yes, LinkedIn, please. I'm very slow on my um, messages and replying because sometimes I get <laughs> overwhelmed. But please just drop me a message if you want help in, in anything. If you want like links to articles to start you know, learning about AI, or if you want me to recommend you some courses out there that are free, or if you just want to chat yeah. or ask that stupid question that you're not asking, please do connect. Yeah, I can tell you, Lara would definitely reply because I've had conversations with her and we still need to catch up in person soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, um, and Lara is doing so much amazing work in the tech space and she's always out talking to people. So definitely follow her. And if you need any help, do reach out to her because she's here. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day of CareerCon and hopefully we'll see you soon. Don't forget to follow us on Honda XYZ and keep up. And this video will be on demand as well. Thank you, Lara. Thanks. Bye. Bye.